It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. I would never do that to you guys. It is a Monster Monday presented, of course, by DraftKings. We've got Sam Munson from Pro Football Focus in the house. Back-to-back Mondays with a Pro Football Focus stud which is perfect during preseason because what's most important isn't the outcome of the games. It's to find out which individuals, especially young players, are really playing well, showing promise, looking like they can play at a high level, and which ones are not. And Pro Football Focus has the answers. I can't watch every preseason game, which is why I bring on Steve Palazzolo or Sam Munson I have tremendous respect for the time and effort these guys put into it, their knowledge. We'll get a uh, a naughty and nice list from Sam momentarily, the good and the bad. I do need to mention it's a new week, which means we'll have a new spread the word winner via social media. I still want the five-star reviews. Just screenshot a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever, and then email it to me, Ross at RossTucker.com. It's really easy. Sponsor confirmation email winners. I love you. I've got a cool press pass from Browns Eagles yesterday. You can take advantage of obviously Simply Safe. We got some new sponsors this week. We got Babel. We got Symbol. I love it. Love some new sponsors. And of course, the YouTube shout out, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. It's fun to watch these shows on uh, on your computer or whatever, or put it up on your TV, as I know some people do, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Just subscribe and then go ahead and make a comment because I see every comment. So when I see the name of somebody I'm not used to, boom, you get a great chance to get like a cameo style shot. And I've been doing cameos a lot this month. So you get one for free. It's a $25 value. Speaking of value, you get a lot of value every time Sam Munton's on the show. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. You need to check him out on social media at PFF underscore Sam. Uh, they got a terrific operation over there at Pro Football Focus. Big fan of Sam and the work that he does. And really, how how quickly do you guys get the grades done, Sam, after like a preseason game? Um, all the grades will be up on the site the following morning. So we have all the, the runs that we go through, the first run stuff, the all 22 looks, all the different processes that we have on each game. And if you thought, you know, watching and grading every single play and every single player in every single NFL game was overkill in the regular season, you know, preseason is the time for you because we are doing this on the rookies, the guys you've never heard of, the guys that are going to be on rosters in a couple of weeks but we have all the information, you know, turnaround time within the uh, the following morning. It'll be up. I think 10 a.m. is our kind of deadline for those grades. That is unreal, man. That's awesome. So you guys are you guys are burning the midnight midnight oil on these preseason games. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is our time. This is where we live for. It's preseason. It's the, the proper football degenerate time when the season is just about to start off again. So I want to get into, let's start, you know, uh, you know me and everybody that is watching or listening knows me. I'm a positive person. I, I love football. I love talking about good football. So let's talk about some of the positives that we saw in particular in week two. It started with the Bears and the Seahawks on Thursday night. Any guys for either team really jump out at you? I know the Seahawks have a couple of rookie tackles that are playing. Yeah, and look, this is what I love about preseason because it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, everything when a guy's playing well, but it's an opportunity for these guys to show that they can make that step up to the next level. And, you know, Seattle's uh, kind of great period started when they had a really good draft, right? They they got Russell Wilson. They got, you know, seriously important members of that, that franchise for the next 10 years. And without Russell Wilson now – they kind of need another one of those drafts. And they drafted a couple of offensive tackles this season. They got Charles Cross, a left tackle. But later on in the draft, they got Abe Lucas, who was probably going to be their starting right tackle as well. Both those guys look good right now. Um, You know, 
it's to be expected with Charles Cross. We really liked him at PFF. I think he was our number one tackle of that group, the trio that was at the top of this draft. But Abe Lucas quietly graded really well in college as well and was a guy that could easily be a starter for them at the other side. If they've managed to secure, you know, good quality bookend tackles in this draft, that's a huge first step in sort of repairing this roster in a, a post-Russell Wilson world. And, you know, so far for them in preseason, I think they've done that. That's awesome. I saw one play where Abe Lucas absolutely annihilated a guy. Now, I will say this, and I'll caution everybody. We And look, I'm, I'm as guilty of it on some level as anyone because I get very excited by Cam Jurgens in Philadelphia and some of the athletic things he's able to do. One highlight of a really good block by a lineman does not a good lineman make, okay? Right. A good lineman is a product of consistently doing what they need to do over and over and over and over again. But it is fun to watch, and I certainly saw – um, that highlight from Abe Lucas, and I thought, oh, man. I mean, he took a guy for a ride, especially coming from, you know, Washington State. I didn't know he had that in him uh, as a run blocker. So I was I was pretty impressed by that. I've been very impressed, Sam, by the, the Pickett and Pickens duo in Pittsburgh. You know, it was not a one-week thing for Kenny Pickett. Even just watching him run that two-minute drill – at the end of the first half, you know, last week, Sam, Greg Cosell said he just has the look and feel of an NFL quarterback. That's exactly what stood out to me on that last drive of the first half uh, in the preseason game against the Jags. Pickett just – he does not look like a rookie. He looks very comfortable. Yeah, I before the draft, I spoke to somebody, you know, quarterback coach in the NFL who was saying that he he didn't like this class at all, but the only guy that had a chance to be something at the next level was Kenny Pickett. And I, I didn't love Kenny Pickett as a prospect. I didn't love his weaknesses for playing well right away. His average time to throw in college was like 3.2 seconds, which would be the longest time to throw in the NFL most years. And that's a number that usually gets longer when you go from college to the NFL. That speed of the game thing you always hear about tends to show up with quarterbacks just sort of slowing down their process because they're not quite up to speed. And so far in preseason, the Steelers seem to have been on a mission to just see if Kenny Pickett can play faster than that. And if you look at things like his average time to throw, his average depth to target, everything is sort of focused on being short quick simplified just don't ask him to do anything long term and, and see if he can do that and absolutely he's done it through the first two weeks that first game was just lightning quick passes really short average depth to target quick and easy the second game like he said was he got that two minute drill he got a chance to sort of do it in a real situation and it's it's tough to argue with what he's been doing he's shown he can absolutely speed up his process and if he can He's got, you know, good enough arm. He's got good enough decision making, good enough athleticism. I think he should be pushing Trubisky to start, you know, sooner rather than later. And that's something I didn't think was necessarily going to happen. And then George Pickens, the receiver, I mean, he could be the steal of the draft when it comes to wide receivers. Maybe Romeo Dobbs will get to him with Green Bay in a little bit. But Pickens has elite first round high end talent. He always has. He had an ACL injury in college. I think that set him back. He also had some – he's an unusual character, which I think sometimes spooks the NFL. And I think those things together maybe made him uh, slide out of the first round. But he went to a perfect situation in Pittsburgh, a perfect coach in Mike Tomlin to manage that kind of thing. And we've seen through training camp, through preseason, like that guy has just got incredible talent. Yeah, he certainly does. And it's interesting – it feels like on some level, the Steelers are comfortable managing interesting personalities, especially at that position. You know, they had Plexico, they had Santonio, obviously they had AB. More recently, they've had Juju, Claypool. I mean, I think the Steelers are just kind of okay with, yeah. like, they're, they're just okay. Like, they're like, you know what? That's just how uh, 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 some of these stud receivers are going to be. I mean, if you could handpick one destination for a guy with that kind of personality to go, it would be Pittsburgh. I mean, Mike Tomlin held Antonio Brown together for like nine years before the thing spiraled out of control. 
and he was gone. Like, this is the perfect destination for a guy like Pickens to land, in addition to the fact that the Steelers know what they're doing, you know, from a, an on-the-field standpoint. So I think Pickens has a real chance to be dominant, like, right away. You know, you mentioned Romeo Dobbs, and we've all seen a tremendous amount of plays he's made in training camp and the preseason games for the Packers. It's interesting because – you know, his quarterback, Carson Strong, put up really good numbers the last couple of years at Nevada. But they had a really good tight end in Cole Turner, and they had Dobbs, who was, you know, the best wide receiver in that conference. Yeah, I and I thought Carson Strong was a really good player. Unfortunate for him having sort of bad knee injuries that, that really hurt his draft stock and his potential maybe at the next level. But Dobbs is the classic preseason guy, right? Because he comes along – and immediately in training camp, it's like, oh, this, this guy looks different than we thought he was going to be. This is not your regular mid-round draft pick. He looks like something a little bit different. And he's been, you know, the benefit of opportunity there. Christian Watson has been hurt. There's been space for him to show up in training camp and look good. But then preseason is the next step. It doesn't mean, you know, the training camp doesn't necessarily mean anything. There's, there's good guys in training camp every year that do nothing once the regular season starts. The, the preseason games are the chance for them to show up and say, OK, we can make the next step as well. Clear the second hurdle. And Dobbs has been doing that like immediately the first game against San Francisco, the deep touchdown catch the second they left him in single coverage. He just gets open. You can see with his movement, he's able to run routes. He's got good body control. He's doing all the same things in preseason that he did in training camp. So that's the second hurdle cleared. And now the next one is going to be, I mean, he's going to earn regular season playing time. And we're going to see if he can get the confidence, the trust in Aaron Rodgers, who, let's be honest, could really use a decent impact wide receiver at it because they don't have Devontae Adams anymore. I think it's a great point. Um, speaking of guys catching the football, Sam, how about Isaiah Likely for the Ravens? Yes. I mean, this guy is one of two tight ends they took, I think, in the fourth round. The Ravens do this, I feel like, a lot, where they like just take two mid-round tight ends. They're like, yeah, one of them will work out. We don't know which one, but one of them will work out. And Isaiah likely has been on fire in both the first two preseason games. Yeah, it's about time Baltimore took a swing on a tight end, right? It hasn't, it's been a while. <laughs> so yeah, I, Isaiah likely looks fantastic. I mean, he's got ball skills, he's got run after the catch skills. He is a dynamic, you know, modern day tight end and the Ravens the offense that they run they're perfectly situated for him to to make an impact without having to be a complete player you know he can be um, a limited guy he can have just a role within that offense and they have that absolutely they have the capacity to accommodate that easily because of all the other players they've got Mark Andrews is one of the best players period in the NFL let alone tight ends he's become a, a spectacular playmaker for them and a guy who's genuinely quarterback proof like his production his ability didn't tail off when Lamar Jackson got hurt last season he continued on trucking continued looking fantastic they've got the ability for likely to just come in and add something dynamic to that offense so he he looks an absolute steal so far what about a guy that um you know I I think you went to the right place with Chris Kachurik as the D-line coach and that's Drake Jackson from USC I love Drake Jackson at draft time. I think, you know, everybody, when they think about pass rushers and edge rushers, what they, they try and look for is that, that Von Miller ability to bend and dip around the edge and that run the hoop. The thing they always sort of, they come up with all these different drills to try and emulate that and try and see that from these prospects. And it's really hard to do because, you know, it's, it's not like a natural movement that you do anywhere other than rushing the passer. Drake Jackson has the cleanest version of that of anybody in this draft class. Like just this beautiful picture, perfect speed rush around the edge. Looks like Robert Quinn when he wins his pass rush reps. There are all those speed uh, moves around the edge. Drake Jackson is so good at that. And the 49ers didn't pick until what was it, 61 in the draft, something like that. And they were able to get Drake Jackson with that pick. A perfect guy to come in opposite Nick Bosa, you know, replace D Ford. And he got hurt after a few reps in his first preseason game, but he looked good in the second one. I, he could be a real value pick for that team. Boy, and, and everything you see is that Nick Bosa has been absolutely tearing up 
training camp, tearing up everything, which is what he does. Um, last guy I wanted to ask you about, kind of went under the radar that the Dolphins drafted Skylar Thompson, the quarterback from Kansas State, but he's done some things in the preseason, hasn't he? Yeah, he had a great game, um, this this most recent one. He was out there, had a couple of really nice big-time throws, had consecutive plays, um, and he's an unusual prospect because he's an older draft prospect. I think we're seeing more of those this year. And they, they, you know, the COVID caused all sorts of issues in terms of an extra year for guys, you know, people getting this sort of free do over to go back to college for a year. It almost feels like once that happened and we got draft time, people started blaming them for it. You know, they, they kind of gave them the extra year for COVID. Yeah. And well, I think I took an extra year in college. Like that's a problem. We don't need that guy. Um, so I think there's players like Skylar Thompson, like Vellis Jones from Chicago, I think is a similar thing, a longer college career. And, and all of a sudden it's like it's an indication of something wrong with them as a prospect. But these guys became good players. And Skylar Thompson was a fun quarterback, an absolute gunslinger. He had an arm that's way you know, good enough to play in the NFL. And I think we saw that that in the preseason, like he's got the ability to still be a factor at this level. Maybe he's not going to be a starting quarterback down the line, but he's earned himself, you know, a look with that that preseason game alone, let alone what, whatever else he's able to do for the rest of this uh, this preseason. Let's go on the negative, uh, Sam, because life is not all, you know, <laughs> peaches and ice cream. You know, there are guys that aren't playing well, and that should be noted also. Uh, now, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess unfortunately for him, Matt Corral looks like he's out for the year with a Liz Frank sprain, but man, Greg Cosell said it last Thursday. I have a feeling you're going to say something similar. Didn't look like he was going to be a guy that was going to get a chance to play this year anyway. Yeah. So honestly, I think the injury in a weird way might be the best thing that could happen to him. You know, they can kind of red shirt him. They can shut him down, put him on IR. He doesn't have to be carried on the active roster and they have to sort of think about getting him ready. He can just focus on his future rather than right now. And yeah, we, we hadn't seen a ton from him, but what we had seen wasn't great. He led a a game winning drive in the, the first preseason game that I think he went one for nine in and featured multiple penalties that just kept bringing them down the field. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the second week wasn't an awful lot better. So I, Matt Corral was coming from a weird offense in college in terms of a system that ran RPOs 40% of the time, something like that. The average NFL team runs them 10% of the time. It's just a completely different world, what he was asked to do in college versus what he's asked to do at the NFL level. So he has a huge leap to go, and he just didn't look ready right now. What about Bo Melton? Uh, we talked about a receiver on the positive side with with Pickens. What about the former Rucker Scarlet Knight? I love Bo Melton as a prospect. I think he's a really talented guy um, and could actually make an impact for Seattle. They've obviously got DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett as their one, too. But that third receiver spot in Seattle is kind of up for grabs. And Melton has got a lot of ability to snag it. But when you're in preseason and you're in limited sample size and you know, small opportunities, the one thing that's going to just torpedo your grade and your game and, and how, every, how you do as a receiver is drops. And he had a couple of them this week and, and really sort of wrecked his grade and hampered his opportunity. He had some targets, had some catches in there as well, but he had a couple of drops that you'd really love to see uh, not exist for him to, to grasp that opportunity and earn a bigger role. And then um... – Man, there's a couple linemen. I, I, I saw it uh, with Icky Aquanu. I didn't get a chance to watch Leatherwood, but there's a couple of linemen that are, are struggling in pass pro. Aquanu's, you know, it's a rookie, but Leatherwood now, it's his second year. The Raiders have struck out on a lot of high draft picks recently. It doesn't seem like Leatherwood's really going to get it, Sam. Yeah, I think they're going to have to move him inside to guard. And even then, that might be a, not be enough. I mean, that was the the hallmark of the previous kind of regime in terms of how they were drafting. Everybody they took in the first round was seen as a big reach, and pretty much all of them struck out. You know, there's, there's a reason why they were seen as reaches at the time. And Leatherwood last season gave up the most pressures of any offensive lineman in the NFL. And that was even after they moved him inside to guard because his time at tackle was – 
completely untenable for the first few weeks. They had to move him because he was such a, a disaster for them. He was better at guard, but it was still a problem spot. You know, this season they they decided, well, let's let's keep him a tackle. Let's see if we can coach him up and get him better. Uh, it doesn't look like it's working. You know, if that was the plan, he if he has a future in the NFL, I think it has to be at guard, and and they need to make that switch sooner rather than later because the offensive line for the Raiders, that's the thing that could completely derail everything for them. Like they're in the toughest division in football. In most seasons, they probably have the fourth best quarterback in the division, even if Derek Carr is a top 15, top 12, top 10 type of quarterback. Um, they've got Devontae Adams. They've got, you know, Darren Waller, Hunter Renfro, but they have an offensive line that might not be viable, you know, and, and Alex Leatherwood is a big part of that. So they need to make sure that that unit doesn't completely undermine like everything else that's going on there. Aquan has done some good stuff in the run game, but he, he does not look like he's uh, ready for prime time necessarily in the passing game. Yeah. And I think, you know, Matt rule kind of said something similar, which is, you know, he's got a long way to go to be a, a high level pass blocker early. And, and, you know, the, the Panthers similar kind of story, right? They've, they've overhauled their offensive line a little bit. They've done a lot of work um, this off season. And I like pretty much, you know, every move they've made, I think they've done a really good job sort of repairing some of the problems that admittedly they created a year ago with some of the moves that they've made, but the, the Baker Mayfield thing has a chance to save their season and, and really propel them in a the right direction. But we've seen in the past, Baker Mayfield doesn't react well when the offensive line starts to fall apart. And when he had Greg Robinson at left tackle and all of a sudden every play, he was expecting pressure, whether it was coming or not. And, you know, I'm not saying that's going to happen with Icky. He's a, he's a great run blocker right now. But if his pass protection does start to become an issue, that could that could be a problem, become a problem and really sort of start to force Baker Mayfield into the bad play that he's absolutely capable of as well. So I think the Mayfield move has a chance to be something really good for them. But the last thing they want is to undermine that with some problematic play on the offensive line. Please check him out on social media at PFF underscore Sam. He is outstanding. Sam, thank you so much for the time. This was perfect. Exactly the uh, the breakdown recap I was looking for. Thanks, buddy. Anytime, man. Take it easy. The other thing I'm a big fan of, as you guys know, is Simply Safe Home Security. We talk about it a lot. It's because I think Simply Safe's awesome. I think home security's awesome. I, I've got home security. And what I love about Simply Safe is there's no long term contract or hidden fees. It shouldn't be that way, right? It shouldn't be really expensive. It's less than a dollar a day. Some of these other companies, they're really expensive, long term contracts, the whole deal. There's nothing more reassuring than when you've been away and you get back and the alarm's still on. That means nobody was in your house. And it's also nice when you go to bed. You set that alarm, you know you're protected. You know if anybody tried to come, you'd be alerted. The police would come. It's awesome. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash Tucker. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. That's simplysafe.com slash Tucker. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Tucks takes. Hey, Ross, good morning. Let's start with Deshaun Watson. Uh, as we all know, of uh, what was it, I guess Thursday or Friday, he reached a settlement on an 11-game suspension and a $5 million fine and counseling, but does not express any remorse publicly with the reporters. So I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. This happened Thursday afternoon. Here's what I would say. On the 11-game suspension, there is always going to be a segment of people maybe a large segment that feel like it's not enough. And to them, I say, I totally understand. I totally understand how you feel that you think a guy should be suspended longer based on, you know, what he's been accused of. What I would tell you is I believe from the NFL's perspective and from my perspective, I think from the NFL's perspective, they did not want a lawsuit. They did not want this to go to court. They did not want him to be suspended for the full year. And then they go to court 
and this is in the news all the time, the latest to Sean Watson, like they did with Zeke Elliott and Tom Brady. I think they think that that's bad business when it gets into the courts. Expensive for everybody involved. Nobody really wins. So I think they wanted to try to settle. And they did. From my perspective, as a guy that hosts a podcast that a lot of you enjoy, I'm glad it was settled and it's not going to court. So we don't have to keep talking about it. Now that's my selfishness, you know, and, and being able to move on from it. The fine is whatever. The counseling was something I said was had to be mandatory. He still really has a problem. I mean, I the fact that he sort of apologized to Aditi King um, or, you know, apologized to the women, to Aditi King Kabwala last Friday, you know, 10 days ago. And then right after the settlement says he's still innocent. And the one that bothers me more is that he never disrespected any women. I just don't understand why he says that. You necessarily disrespected women if 24 of them filed a lawsuit against you. Like, I don't understand the terminology as he's trying to use it. And uh, it's infuriating. His lack of remorse is infuriating. Tux takes. Big Ten conference cashed in. Huge deal. It's going to net them over a billion dollars a year for the next seven years. Unbelievable, man. I mean, just unbelievable. The only reason I mentioned that here is because college football players are going to start to get paid. With that much money coming in, I know they're getting NIL from outside sources. They're going to start to get paid by the colleges if the colleges are making this much money. Tux takes. Still no firm date on when Tom Brady is going to return. That comes from Todd Bowles. Although I did see, Bri, that um, there's a lot of reports out there that he might be back as soon as today. And I saw a report that he went part of the time he was away, part of those 10 days, he went to an exclusive resort in the Bahamas. I am blown away by this. This just does not seem like Tom Brady to me. You know, maybe his wife said, listen, we know what it's like once the season starts. It's like you go into a cave and we don't talk to you all year. I want some family time before the season starts. And this is what they came up with, like rather than right before training camp. I, I'm stunned by this as a guy that knows him. Tux takes. Report says uh, Akib Talib started a fight that uh, eventually led to his brother killing a youth football coach. Terrible story absolutely awful i saw where akib talib said he's stepping away from his new role at amazon yeah do you think i mean there's a video and akib is in it at a youth football game and then reportedly his brother pulled out a gun and shot the guy i i just i don't even know what to say awful tux takes all right, some of the notable injuries from week two preseason. Patriots wide receiver Tyquan Thornton broken collarbone. Panthers Matt Corral, Liz Frank, he's done for the season. Uh, you and Sam already talked about that one. And Tampa's uh, starting left guard Aaron Stinney torn ACL. He's out. Second half. Now that, you know, they were competing with other guys, but Stinney had a really good chance to be the starting left guard. ACL, MCL, second half, that's a big injury. Thornton looked like the best Patriots rookie receiver in a long time. Now he's out. And then Corral, we already talked about. Tux takes. All right, anything else from the preseason that stood out to you? Well, I, I love doing these Eagles games, man. Um, man, if you watch yesterday, Eagles have some really good depth, especially on offense. Cam Jurgens again, their O-line. Their second string O-line, it's impressive. But I got to give a shout-out, Bri, to the Cleveland Browns press box. You know, I remember going, going there years ago, and it was terrible. Absolutely terrible. At some point, the Browns organization, maybe it was Stefanski, they made a decision, we're going to have better press box food. 
They had a tremendous fruit salad. Then they had really nice potatoes. They had chicken parm bry. They had pork loin. They have a great salad bar. They had brats. They had dogs. They have a dessert tray. Now, their drink choices are highly questionable. They have RC Cola. They don't even have any diet RC Cola. I don't like to drink my calories other than beer. So I went with Diet Dr. Pepper. I have Diet Dr. Pepper exactly once a year whenever I'm in Cleveland because that's their only diet drink choice in the press box. But really impressive. I mean, I'm saying, Bri, it's an A. I mean, they get an A. And if the drink choices were better, they would get an A+. I had chicken parm, potatoes, and pork loin at like 10.45, no, like 11 o'clock. And then I made a salad and sliced up the pork loin, put it on top of the salad. That's why I ate at halftime. Just awesome. Awesome performance by the Browns. Uh, what's not awesome, I guess, is Texans cutting fullback Andy Janovich. You know, he had a $700,000 guarantee and they cut him. Man, that's a lot of money to waste. I guess it's not as much as it used to be, but to give a guy seven hundred grand and then cut him, ouch. Although if he gets picked up somewhere else, I think maybe 500000 of it is a salary guarantee. He'll get picked up somewhere else. So some of that will be offset. I will give shout outs to Pizza Boy Brewing, Sporticulture, HumanHeadNYC.com, SteakhouseSports.com, Go-Bangles.com, Evergreen Economics, and MyFrontPageStory.com, of course, the greatest gift you can give anyone. Check out the College Draft Podcast. I thought Emery was fantastic. It's really three podcasts in one, and it's getting closer. It's week three of the preseason, the last preseason week. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.